Good afternoon. This is the last of the content reviews for WAP or your test. This is technically unit six because the AP exam this year is going to be on units one through six, which is again year 1200, unit one, to 1900, which is the end of unit six. So unit six is the second part of what's considered the modern era of world history. And the modern era is 1750 to 1900. You notice on the screen that I have 1900 and then in parentheses I have 14. Uh, like many things with periodization, they tend to pick whole numbers because then seem nice and kind of rounded. But to me, a lot of what starts in 1750, the processes, the patterns, ends truly with World War I, which is why I put 1914. I guess you could put 1918. Either way, it's the same. So notice that some things that will be talked about on this slide and some things you'll see on DBQ practices and the like, they might be dated a little bit past 1900 because these same patterns are occurring. So in Unit 5, which we did last week, that was primarily on the Atlantic Revolutions Atlantic revolutions might be a term you're not familiar with, but it basically means the revolutions that occur in states that border the Atlantic. So that would be the American, the French, the Haitian, and all the various Latin American revolutions that are pictured on the map here. Okay. Unit six is the same time period, but it's more about the consequences of one of those unit five revolutions, the industrial revolution. So think of unit five, revolutions, as kind of the cause. And then unit six is the effect of these new mechanization of labor. So if you look at the bullet points I have listed here, these are all of the many or subunits of unit six that are various consequences of what happens with the industrial process. So the first bullet is about imperialism. That's a major thing of this entire unit is really, they could have called it Unit 6 Imperialism, but they instead wanted you to think of it as consequences of industrialization. So when you look at, let me go back for a second. So if you look at, first off, I want you to understand the causes and then the rationalizations for imperialism. They want to continue to look at states that expand past the original borders during this era. There'll be two newcomers. There'll be the United States, and there'll be the Japanese. And the Japanese aren't new, but expanding outside the home islands will be new. Okay. And then there'll be responses to these expansions. So indigenous means native peoples. So if you look over at the United States, which you learned in eighth grade about manifest destiny spreading from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the natives that are in the way, their responses, military, their defeats, the reservation thing, the Trail of Tears, those are all indigenous responses to state expansion. So at this time, that bullet point is looking at those indigenous responses in Africa, those indigenous responses in India as the British expand their empire, Aborigines in Australia, Australia finally makes the makes the map okay. so then the, the unit takes a little economic twist because of industrialization what happens to the global economy and we'll talk about that in a second economic imperialism is taking the same thing that's happening politically the expansion of these industrial states and seeing how they expand their economies and those impacts that they have on the non-industrialized world then the last two, or not last two, but the next to last two, look at another impact of the mechanization of transportation and communication, a subset of industrialism, uh, global migrations. There's always been migrations. In 1750 to 1900 is when it's, uh, it's immigration or migration on steroids. And there'll be a close, another one of these maps that shows what groups are coming, where, and why. So the causes of this migration and then the effects on both the migrants and then the receiving societies. And then lastly, they want the skill that we focused on in this entire unit is to be causation. 
cause and effect relationships. So when you guys took that Albert's diagnostic, the four of those bullet points that you had the most problems with were the rationale for imperialism. It's going to give you a one page kind of summary of things to know. Four different rationales for states building empires overseas, usually developed world, taking over the developing world. There's four ways that these civilizations were conquering were rationalizing. And with the growth of science and evolutionary theory in the 1800s, there'll be an application of that idea of survival of the fittest for Darwinian evolution. And we'll apply that survival of the fittest to human beings. And so that the building of empire, the winners and losers of the imperial game, that's just natural because some are more fit than others. And that's called social Darwinism. Nationalism is another rationalization because it's, in a sense, pitting some nations are winners and some are losers. So not on the human scale, one group of people better than the other, but nations better than the other. So the British race is being superior to other nations. The civilizing mission we'll spend more time on. Sometimes it's called the white man's burden, but it's the idea that the Industrial societies, the technologically and scientifically superior, they have a duty to spread those benefits to others. And the duty implies that you are the teacher, those you take over are the student, parent child kind of relationship. And I misspelled it there, but a religious mission too can apply the idea that Christianity needs to be spread so the true word of God can be displayed in that kind of religious mission sense. So we'll talk about some of these. Global economic development would be the creation of not just like in previous areas, uh, luxury goods economy, but specific resources that are going to be exported back to the developed world, to the industrial world, to fuel the factories and then fuel the people. So it's not just goods that the rich would buy, it's mass goods the raw materials for these mass goods that the factories and the workers need. So on the other effect or other consequence of industrialization, we have the migrations. So on the causes of migrations, it's going to be pretty simple. The developed world, developing world will move to the developed. We'll look at some push-pull factors in that. And what you're going to be seeing is that global urban centers, where these industrial economies are going to be centered they are now interconnected to the developing world because of the invention of the steamship versus just sailing. Effects of this, most migrants are males because they're moving for work. Inside major urban centers that these steamships connect, you're going to have ethnic enclaves. Think of the phrase Chinatown. We'll talk about some of those. And then the receiving societies don't necessarily, they need them, they need the labor, but they don't, have, they don't agree with the importation of culture. So on this effects of migration, but we're looking at it in the modern era, 1750 to 1900. A lot of these trends continue to this day. So different rationales for imperialism. You'll see in the map itself, there's some political cartoons that we'll look some at in a little bit. Remember rationale means how you explain something as being correct versus just saying, well, we conquered because we want to conquer. So we're going to look in a second at the idea of the white man's burden that Europeans and Americans will use to justify their conquests of Africa, the United States, it'll be the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam. Uh, for Europeans, it'll be Africa, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa. For, and there's also the kind of a Christian mission we talked about earlier. You see these explorers, David Livingston, uh, explores Africa looking for, at first, a lost Christian missionary. But then he gives the opening for Europeans to kind of rationalize their conquest of Africa as we're there to end slavery 
and protect these developing societies and Christianizing them. In Eurasia, we see Russian expansion. The Peter the Great, previous era, tries to modernize. And then once they're modern, the Russian bear will then try to attack its neighbors and move into the Ottoman Empire. And then their own manifest destiny, like we talked about in Unit 3, Pacific, which means all those indigenous Siberian peoples will be their victims. China and India will be the other victims of European imperialism. So to rationalize that, there's the idea that the British are in South Asia to end primitive practices like the sati, the ritual funeral where the wife would throw herself on a funeral pyre. They play that up as being kind of almost pandemic, like it happens all over the place. And they were there then to cure those superstitions and bring modern technology, modern science to a backwards place. The White Man's Burden is a, 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 a kind of propaganda piece that we'll talk about for there. And for China, all these competing powers will try to argue that China needs to be open for free trade. And if they try to close their doors, then they're going against free trade, so we got to force our way in. It's called the open door policy. Over here in Latin America, the United States doesn't want Europe to do what they did to Africa, to Latin America. So they invent something called the Monroe Doctrine, which means that the new world is closed to the old world. There'll be no recolonization, because instead, Uncle Sam, would be the economic dominant power in Latin America, keeping Latin America open for our business, or at least that's the theory. So let's look at some of these propaganda pieces that imply some of those rationales for imperialism. On the left, you have Cecil Rhodes, who was a British figure who in South Africa uh, carves out his own empire he names it after himself, Rhodesia. Uh, he was the founder of a company called De Beers. De Beers still exists. It's a diamond conglomerate. Uh, the diamond conglomerate has a monopoly on all the diamonds that are dug up in South, America, South Africa. Uh, Rhodesia today is Zimbabwe. But you'll see in South Africa, Zimbabwe, a lot of white settlers who are colonizing to reap the were diamond rewards, the gold that's discovered there. And what Rhodes is an example of is a businessman who urges Britain to build empire for financial reasons. And at one time, the goal was that the British empire would span the continent from its possessions in South Africa, all the way up the Nile to Egypt. And they show Cecil Rhodes dressed as a soldier connecting Africa with the telegraph. The idea of bringing modernization. Now we see us to bring modernization with a gun. That's how they can force their way in. Over here we have an ad for soap, on Paris soap. And you see the word, the, white, the phrase, the white man's burden being used there. But the first step towards lightening the white man's burden is through teaching the virtues of cleanliness. If you look down here where it says, Paris soap is a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances. While amongst the cultured of all nations, it holds the highest place. It is the ideal toilet soap. So you see this very kind of racist tones here, of white versus dark. White versus dark. Steamship, modern bathroom, bringing the benefits the soap to the corners of the civilization that's dark and backwards. So that's one element of kind of that light man's burden. The title actually comes from a poem by Rudyard Kipling. So now you're probably looking at the image first. But this is John Bull. He's kind of the Uncle Sam of England. This is Uncle Sam. You see they're burdened. So they're going to carry all these peoples they control. A lot of racist imagery here, the caricatures of faces. 
and you see that they're having to carry these people over these rocks like ignorance, oppression, barbarism, vice, brutality, slavery, oddly enough, slavery, slavery in society, have been through slavery, up towards the goal of civilization. So as you look at this poem, you're going to notice this imagery of the white man has this burden of this job to do, to bring civilization, to protect them from themselves. And it's a hard burden, it's toil, but you're doing it for their benefit. It's very patronizing. It sets up this, and you even see it somewhere in this first stanza. Who are these people you're conquering? They're newly caught. They're half devil, half child. So if they're devilish and childlike, then you're the parent, you're the teacher. You're going to do what you got to do. Now, the odd thing about this poem is it's probably satirical because it was put out when the United States in the late 1800s was in war with Spain. And then as a, con uh, a consequence of defeating Spain, we, the United States, got their possessions, which were the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the remnants of their empire. And there was a debate in this country on what do we do? The country's never expanded past its original borders into societies that had established populations that are vastly ethnically different. Yeah, Native Americans, sure, but not in these large numbers. So the debate was, do we want to become like in England or Britain? And this is, probably, this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, this is what you have to do if you're going to become an empire builder. You really want to do that. So that was one of those rationales for imperialism. So the other thing you guys have problems with was this concept of how the economic development on the planet has changed because of industrialization. So we should look at this map first. Got a bunch of different things pictured here. From uh, Finnipedia, I took the original map that has these products listed. And I also wrote a uh, text on here the logos for some multinational corporations that are going to manage these, these, this trade, whether it's a banking corporation, this is the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, that in Asia is going to be the corporation that finances all this trade, it still exists today. The Wells Fargo of Asia, De Beers, it's Cecil Rhodes Diamond Mining Company, it still controls the diamond trade on the planet. This is the 1800s logo for what's called the United Fruit Company. And they were even so bold, the United Fruit Company, to have in their logo a rifle to show you that they were enforcing the exploitation of the fruit that they grew in other people's countries. And then in Hawaii, you have established the Dole Pineapple Company. Dole Fruits is still around. And what Dole will do is he'll instigate a revolution the plantings, the planting company, and the planters against the Hawaiian monarchy. And they overthrow the, the queen, and they eventually get Hawaii annexed. So this is the era of big business. Not the charter companies of the past, like the British East India Company. These are wholly private entities that are going to manipulate their home country into doing the conquering and conquest. They're not going to con conquer on their own. Well, the East India Company had an army this time in this era. The other companies are going to have to manipulate the nations into doing their bill. So, if you look at this question I ask you over here, how are these economic developments, these new raw materials, the consequence of industrialization? So, if all these places are mining or growing these crops, export to the factories shown here, which you would think of this idea of fuel. They need the fuel to feed the factories. So rubber, for the conveyor belts, oil, not oil as in gasoline oil, but palm oil as a lubricant to grease the wheels of the belts. Right? The metals that you're going to make into the iron for the railroads, for the steamships. But you also need fuel to feed these masses of workers that are going to be in your cities. 
So some of these countries are going to become exports of food. So wheat and beef and meat in South America. The wheat and beef in the Plain States of the United States. Those will be shipped back to the East Coast to feed the East Coast populations. Beef in retail of South America goes to Britain, and so on and so forth. And so it's industrial products or industrial food, the fuel for the factories, the fuel for the people that shape the economic development of this country. So it's not just Europeans doing it, the Japanese can do it too. The Japanese in this end of this era will conquer Korea. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, in the 20s and 30s, they'll move into China. So with those global economic developments, we're going to get migration. So there are lots of migrations listed here. Um, talk about some of them that you might not be more aware of. You pretty much know about Europeans going from Europe to North America. In the modern era, it's not British, Scottish migrants. It becomes the Irish, Germans, Italians, and some small pockets of Lebanese merchants. Mm-hmm. So out on the west coast of the United States, like the Japanese and the Chinese, but what's happening on the west coast of the U.S. is also happening in Latin America. Okay. In the British Empire, in the Indian Ocean Zone, you have Chinese migrants going to Australia, but you also have Indians moving into other areas of the British Empire to serve as labor. So you have pockets in South Africa. For instance, the most famous South Asian for most of you would be Gandhi. Gandhi begins his career as a lawyer in South Africa advocating for the rights of the Indian population in, this, in South Africa. Okay. What this Russian one is trying to show is just Russians moving into Siberia to look for the Pacific. So why is this movement happening? So why are people forced to leave? There are famous things like the potato famine, where there's a failure of the potato crop for four years in Ireland. So they go to where they can get jobs and food. So the pull of jobs, industrialization, the pull of land, open American lands, because you depopulated them from Native Americans. Irish people won't go to the East Coast of the United States, and then they'll migrate to, 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 to the Great Plains. For instance, Oklahoma, you'll see that it has a giant Irish population of people descended from Ireland. And the Russian state, or the Russian Empire, you had a series of persecutions of Jewish peoples, like pogroms in the late 1800s. And then some Jewish people, this is what the big blue is, will just get the hell out of it. Why don't they stay around being persecuted? And that's why we'll have uh, Jewish populations in the East Coast of the United States. In China, they'll have the single most destructive rebellion in human history, the Taiping Rebellion. 14 years, this basic civil war in Japan and in China between the established Qing dynasty and revolutionary supporters of what are called the Taiping, uh, killed about 20 million. So some flee this violence by getting on the ships of the British or the Americans. In the American case, they come to build the railroad that connects the west to the east. And then I think I have covered up for guys. Anytime there's unrest, another push factor in Europe, there'll be a series of revolutions beginning with the French in the late 1700s, early 1800s. You have another series of uprisings in 1848. These are largely lower class uprisings against the upper class in the governments. The revolution in 1848 is not successful. A lot of wars in Italy to unify the different Italian states in their one country. That will be successful in 1861. And then another in Germany in 1871, where the different German states are united into a Germany. <clears throat> Anytime you have those kind of conflicts, there'll be displaced refugees. A lot of those refugees will migrate to the Americas. The Italian one going down to Brazil. Brazil and Argentina have big populations of Italian descended people to this day. Okay. So the other pull factor 
industrialization, where there's jobs in factories, workers can go. Remember, workers need to be fed, so you need farm labor. So the Japanese, the Chinese can also work on the farms. And then where there's empty land, you need colonists. So they would come to the United States to help and spread and get their own land. But then when you have already established networks of trade because of economic imperialism, you can even ship those conquered peoples, like Indians, to work in the lands that we conquered as well. So there was push and pull factories. So the effects of these migrations, they do the negative first. Sometimes there's resentment to these waves of immigrants that are seen as taking over and changing your culture. So you look first on the right, you would see signs like this posted on the East Coast of the United States. Some jobs would be not available for the Irish. They just call you out and say no. In the bottom right, this is the, the symbol of a political party that develops in the United States called the Know Nothing Party. And this was their slogan. And when they say Native Americans, they don't mean Indians. They were there in their minds saying the Native Americans, meaning the Anglo-Saxon Protestant descendants of British and Scottish colonists, are now saying that America is theirs, and they don't want this next wave of immigrant, the Russian Jew, the German, the Irishman, the Italian, changing their country. So you see Uncle Sam, mm -hmm. you see the uh, Lady Liberty kind of in shock because of what they're seeing as these words of immigrants. So you have these feelings, so sometimes you still have those feelings today. Back then, you also had government action. It was kind of funny to look at this cartoon on the left. Uh, there was a series of laws passed in the 1880s called the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Chinese migrants were excluded, kept out. And there's a depiction of a wall being built throughout the United States to prevent more Chinese migrants. And you see here the flag of the Know Nothing Party. Because that was what they championed this idea of stop immigrants. So let that sink in for a moment. The wall, mm -hmm. no immigrants, the Know Nothing Party. And you see fragments of a newspaper talking about the Chinese were excluded by law. So this exclusion, exclusionary reaction to immigration doesn't just happen in the United States. You also see it in Australia. Remember, there were immigrants, mostly Chinese, moving to Australia. So in the turn of the century, you had what was called the White Australian Policy. On the left, it's kind of a poster for that. And the lyrics of the song are here. Australia, Australia, sunny south of all Britannia suns. Australia, the white man's land, defended by the white man's hands. Australia, Australia, the Anglo-Saxon race and Southern Cross. God bless and help us to protect our glorious land, Australia. This is from an Australian newspaper depicting pretty racially prejudiced caricature of a Chinese figure entangling the white Australians, robbery, fanaticism, bribery, opium, disease, prostitution, I don't know what Pakapu is, cheap labor, just propaganda to kind of support this idea of excluding those from Australia. So those are the negative effects. Positive effects or just effects in general are since these populations are not generally received into the receiving population, they'll form what are called ethnic enclaves. That's in some case still exist to this day. So the top left is an image of a Chinatown. And these ethnic enclaves would keep your native language. They would have newspapers in Chinese in different sections. In cities of the East Coast U.S., you'd have Little Italy's where things are being Italian. This is a map, current day map of Manhattan Island in um, New York. Oh. Sorry, my dogs. You see Little Italy. You see Chinatown. Neighborhoods that exist today. More in 
more in kind of historical versus this now just ethnic context today, the more tourist attractions. The bottom right, how does Irish culture kind of start from enclaves and then become more dispersed, you know, like the charms of leprechauns and Patrick's Day celebrations. This map shows the percentages of people descended from the Irish. That was not in the South. It's usually in Massachusetts, urban areas of the East Coast, but then oddly enough, Oklahoma. I remember I said they were pushed by famine, but pulled by jobs and the offer of land. We have the Oklahoma land rush, where Oklahoma, which was supposed to be an Indian reservation, the whole state, they carve out even parts of Indian reservations and open them to settlements to try to ease the crowding in the East Coast. So a lot of Irish immigrants. So these are two examples of ethnic enclaves in the United States. Uh, Boston is a major enclave. Think of the basketball team, the Boston Celtics. That's an Irish thing. There was also an Indian diaspora or dispersal from India proper to areas that were controlled by the British Empire. Like I said earlier, South Africa. I used to work with a guy in high school who was from Uganda. He was Indian. He was driven out of Uganda after his family had been there for two centuries. And a dictator named Idi Amin came and settled in Dallas in the 80s. You'll also have Indians in the Caribbean, islands uh, controlled by the British. And of course, you'd have them in Australia, Canada. Because where the empire is, Indians can go as well. So those are some of the effects of migration. So this is a lot. There are a lot of things. You know, five and six, and consequentially, are probably two very important units to study again before the test. Uh, we're going to do a DBQ this week, which I guess is last week for you on revolutions. But this week, we're going to be planning and writing them, dealing with unit six. That is all. Thank you for listening.